So hello everyone, welcome back to Aman TV and now we have a very special guest with us, Parth and I would like Parth to introduce himself. Hi, yeah. so my name is Bart. Um, I'm originally from India, but I've been living in UK for the past um, 10, 11 years now. I've just finished my bachelor's degree in neuroscience, uh, which I studied at King's College London. But I also went to Australia for a year abroad uh, at University of Melbourne, which is where me and I'm in there. Yep, that's right. So the main highlights is he studies, he has completed his studies in King's College in London, right? And you came yeah. to University of Melbourne, which is in Melbourne, of course. And yeah. I went to RMIT University, which is also in Melbourne. So we met over there. So, yep. So as you guys might be knowing, I'm an Indian. I went there to Australia in February 2020. And after two or three weeks of being there, stage three, stage four mm -hmm. lockdown started. And so Parth and I were looking for accommodation together. So we have quite a lot of experience in how to get the accommodation, what are the prices and stuff like that. So first yeah. of all, like, let's keep accommodation aside. And we are going to start with the tuition fees. So part, you have been to UK, you, you study in UK, you have been to yeah. America as well. So, so um, I mean, for me, it's a bit different because I'm a, I'm, I've got uh, the UK citizenship. I am a home student. So for me, over here is 9,250. But so in terms of international students, it varies according to university and it varies according to your course. I know for my course at King's College London, it was about 30,000 to 35,000 pounds one year per year. Um, whereas if you were to go, for example, at a less prestigious university, a uh, University of Leicester, University of Coventry, those are normally cheaper at, I would say around 15 to 20,000 pounds a year. Uh, you can also go higher. So if you go Cambridge, Oxford, Imperial or something, those are around 50 to 60,000 pounds a year. Uh, but it really depends on which course you're doing and uh, where you're doing it. Perfect. And as you might be knowing, I have also applied in University of Birmingham for a semester abroad program mm -hmm. for this coming January intake. So hopefully yeah. I get it. <laughs> so, because previously also I applied for this coming intake, July intake semester abroad and I got a seat in University of Alberta in Canada. But RMIT somehow thought that it is unsafe for its students and oh. cancelled the whole program. And I was like, I'm not an Australian citizen. I'm not even in Australia. How could you... Like, make this decision on my behalf so yeah coming That's back to the topic if i talk about the tuition fees here in australia i'm paying around 14 lakh rupees i'm talking in terms mm -hmm. of indian rupee oh and yeah if oh, i sorry in terms of rupees uh, over here so um what's it 30 lakh uh, 30 000 pounds is around about 30 lakh rupees so 30 yeah. 35 lakh rupees that's right so, mm -hmm. and if I go to University of Birmingham, although I do not have to pay them the fees, I have to pay RMIT because that is my host institute. Uh, so, University of Birmingham's international student fees for the same course that I'm doing here at RMIT is around 23 to 24 lakh rupees. So, are you gonna, mm -hmm. are you seeing the difference like 14 lakhs mm -hmm. and then pay 23 to 24 lakhs? So, UK is expensive, but of course, mm -hmm. it has its own perks as well. So, coming to the second topic cost of living now you have lived in melbourne as well and i guess you were living in the cbd area yeah yeah and so in terms of melbourne i lived um, pretty much like just across my university which was about two minutes from the city center like the cbd where all the shops and everything are um at that time living in a uni lodge accommodation from what i remember i was paying 250 dollars a week or something um what's that in rupees that is around 13,000 rupees. 13,000? 13, yeah. That's 000 about 000. one. Yeah. So okay. that's what I found is um, accommodation was a lot cheaper in Melbourne compared to UK, especially London, because in London, um, I would honestly recommend to budget around 200 to 250 pounds. So uh, 20 to 25,000 rupees a week for your accommodation and your food costs and everything like that. If you want to save some money, you can live away from university, like um, one or two hours away, but then you have to travel that much. Uh, that might save you some uh, money, but that, of course, depends on your preference. If you move outside of London, of course, it's a lot cheaper. So if you're going up north in terms of uh, Liverpool, Manchester, then those tend to be cheaper at around about £150 a week or so to £200 a week maximum. Uh, but that includes, uh, so in that, I've included your food and everything like that as well, like average kind of bill for 
uh, food cost and transport cost. Of course, you can go as high as you like if you want a luxury accommodation and everything, but that's anywhere. In terms of Melbourne, what I found was, um, what's good about Melbourne is eating out is really cheap. I don't know how, but uh, you can get food like really, really cheap in terms of Mexican food, Indian food. I think um, I used to go to a place uh, where you can get unlimited Indian thali for $7 or something, which is just unheard of in UK. Like you never get that here. I went um, Penny Rocks, yeah. it was like $10 and it was yeah. really good. It fills you up really well, like, well. So that's, I really enjoyed that about Melbourne. Food-wise, Melbourne wins. Um, but in terms of groceries, if you're buying meat, then it does get a bit expensive in Melbourne. So it's better if you go to like the fresh markets and everything that they have on and try and bargain your price to get the food. Uh, UK, on the other hand, um, it depends, like again, where you are. If you're in London and you're going to like fresh markets and everything, they're going to be a lot more expensive. If you're outside of London, it's going to be cheaper. If you just go supermarket and everything, like your average, so I'm a vegetarian and my average bill used to be about 20 to 25 pounds a week or so. So I didn't used to go overboard. But that was also because uh, my mom used to give me some food like uh, chapatis and everything. Anyway. So then I just used to make some sabjis and all that. Um, so in terms of, again, food as well, it depends, but mostly I would say Melbourne is a lot better in terms of uh, living costs uh, overall. Okay, then. In short, Melbourne wins when it comes to food and groceries and everything. Yeah, yeah. by far. And yeah, because it's just a lot cheaper in Melbourne, I think. Yeah, that's right. And uh, just so you guys know, Parth and I were like searching for accommodation. We were four mm-hmm. friends and we were searching for an accommodation in, in which like we four will be living together, but due to some like yeah. problems or some shortcomings, we like split and then two went yeah. together. So I, I mean, was, COVID was a talk. bit of a, yeah, COVID really interrupted our things. Yeah. And with COVID, we had to go back afterwards anyway. So it's a shame. Yeah, COVID. So. <laughs> so coming to the second, uh, next topic, universities, education style, like, what was the difference that you experienced uh, in King's College and between these two universities? Yeah. So I think there's, that's the biggest difference I experienced. Now, in terms of the teaching style, uh, what you see in UK with most of the universities, what you have is a one-year course. So like one year kind of, um, uh, so what you have basically is two semesters. But whatever you learn in those two semesters, although you may have like a mid-year exams, all your final exams are normally at the end of the year and you have your coursework throughout the whole year. Whereas at University of Melbourne, what they had was a semester. I think RMIT is probably similar. They have finals at the end of each semester. So it's a lot more condensed. So in one semester, you'd have to work a lot harder to do all of your assignments and all of your final exams. But the next semester, you wouldn't look at that one module again. Like you just forget about that and move on to your next module. With that, what I personally found was, um, I think it might depend on people's styles, but having a one year, like kind of a a program, uh, like each year having finals at the end of it, it allowed me to reflect on the modules a bit more, like learn a bit more from them, but also it allowed me to go at a slower pace and really learn like all the details. Whereas in Melbourne, I had to rush things a bit. So because it was only one semester at the end of it, I'd have my finals and everything. I'd have to rush um, like the coursework and I'd have to learn everything just for the exam. But then after the exam, I would forget a lot of things again. So in that sense, I personally like the teaching style of um, UK universities a bit better. Um, But on top of that, I think the other thing was um, the kind of extra support they give you and everything. So again, with that, it was, I think it'll vary according to your course and everything, how much support you get, how much tutoring you get. But so in uh, King's College London, what I had was a primary tutor uh kind of like king's parents so they're like uh, people in the year above you so if you need any help with university work or something you can go to them there was a pal kind of a scheme where if you were struggling in any modules then you can have uh one-to-one tutoring or like group tutoring with um again people from like the years above so they know a bit like they've already done this and so that really put like a support um a lot of support in the in place so if i needed anything then i knew who to go to and I can just ask someone really quickly and get that support straight away. Whereas University of Melbourne didn't really have any of that. So that kind of concerned me a bit. So if I had any questions, I would just have to go to my lecturer and ask the lecturer straight. But that's not always easy because of course lecturers are also researchers and they have a lot of their own work going on. So they can't provide you one-to-one tutoring in that sense. And um, I think the third thing that I realized was um, the opportunities that you get. 
again, in Melbourne, I think the opportunities were more based on activities, like extracurricular activities and everything. They really focused on that. Whereas at King's College London, what I found was there were really kind of academic opportunities. So I could um, have, well, like uh, I could have recently contributed to an actual research that's going on. So that might be published in the future. Then uh, I, you get approached by like a lot higher up companies, which are already in contact with uh, at least King's University. So the opportunities that you get for the future, I felt were a bit better at um, King's College London as compared to University of Melbourne. Perfect. Like there is one thing that uh, felt shocking to me that you talked mm -hmm. about, like uh, the one you were referring to as like you had those things in UK that you can go to your seniors. Or yeah. Mentors or academic mm -hmm. mentors. So we have mm -hmm. that thing in RMIT as well. Like uh, okay. yeah. there is a program like career mentorship in which you can go for career yeah. mentorship. And apart from that, That's there is one more program in which like there are like, if you go to a room, you mm -hmm. will have some research scholars and people who have done the courses that you are doing right now. In yeah. The previous okay. years. yeah. That's quite good. They are ready to help you. That's really good, actually, because I was really surprised at University of Melbourne. They didn't really have any of that kind of direct support. And I mean, the, I, I guess the only difference there would be this is kind of you have um, your own kind of group chat. So you already have like a chat um, from the start of the year with your seniors and with your tutors and everything. So it's a lot more direct, at least at King's. So I can just pick up my phone and um, message someone like, what, what's this? Or like, uh, can I get some help with this? Uh, but yeah, I think University of Melbourne might have it differently, or it might differ based on your course because we didn't quite have different. any chats. Uh, it's not that simple. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, you approach any person like because I have studied only online most of it. Mm -hmm. I just went to the university for two weeks, and for the first two weeks, who well, like goes to yeah, no. seniors for studies, and I was just enjoying that time. Mm -hmm. So over here we have to like if I'm talking if I talk about the online version of it, uh, you have to like approach the person, the senior that you want to get mentorship from, or you want him to like help you out, and mm -hmm. then he accepts really your good, request, yeah. and then you have to like get in touch with that person. So this was that's me. really good still. I think maybe RMIT provides that, or maybe it's like different courses because I didn't find any of that at University of Melbourne during my time over there. So that was very shocking, but that's really good that you said that. Yeah, that's right. And one more thing, like there is a program and I'm, I'm pretty sure there would be in University of Melbourne as well, like RMIT mates. So this mm -hmm. mates program is like when I was here in India and I enrolled in RMIT university. So I got a mail regarding this program. So it mm -hmm. is like, uh, if I go to a website and I enroll for this mates program, I will be assigned a mentor who is going to be in his second year, third year or fourth year. Yeah. And then he will, he or she will have another four to five men mentees. Right. Right. Part yeah. Group. That's quite so good. Yeah. Like, group and we used to hang yeah. out a bit. So it that's was really fun. good. Yeah. That's yeah. That's good. He said, cause I was really shocked when I saw nothing like that. I approached to a couple of um, lecturers at university of Melbourne and at least they hadn't heard of anything. So maybe it was the department itself, but, I didn't find any of that at University of Melbourne. I think, yeah, you, uh, people will probably have to look into that. Um, or maybe it's because it was like a year ago kind of a thing. So that might be a bit different to yeah, when you initially enrolled. But that's really good they have that then. I was, yeah, I was going to be a bit surprised. Because this RMIT mates program helped me a lot because when yeah, I went helpful. here, in the very first week, they all like planned to meet and then meet yeah. and meet sort of thing. Then we had this RMIT morning tea in which every mentor and every mentee came here so i made a lot of friends through that program and we still are some of us are in contact so it's like pretty chill. that's really good yeah i mean actually the other thing that i found at university of melbourne as well you have a lot of these social events so and a lot of times they're free so you have like um one free festival a week with like barbecue food there's always kind of outdoors getting togethers and everything which um again that aspect at king's you can be a part of societies and everything but it's a lot more formal. Like I think the culture itself in UK, it's a bit more formal as compared to uh, Melbourne or like Australia in general. So these kind of meetups would be a bit more planned. So like society meetups or socials like that. Whereas University of Melbourne, they're a bit more spontaneous. Like they'll just message you saying, oh, it's a guy, like there's going to be this thing on tomorrow. Come down if you want and everything. And they're like a lot of them are free. Whereas at King's, uh, most of the events are like paid and everything. So that's another aspect. You that's take the for the 
uh, australian universities like mm. students studying at australian so what we had over there in rmit is that i was part of two societies mm. and i am the international student representative for rmit is islam society so the thing yeah. is that we plan a lot of stuff if you are a member if you are just yeah. a, no no if you are a plan, member of the committee right yeah if you are just yeah. a member then you get all the perks without like putting in the yeah. effort or doing the planning and sort of exactly yeah i think <laughs> they missed that in uk a bit uk it's a lot more formal for those kind of events but um yeah i think it depends on your preference as well there but yeah yeah that's right yeah i can like guarantee that that this australian thing is pretty chill because <laughs> yeah. my friend uh, he was in the i don't know musicians club something of that sort and mm. guitar club or something related to that so what they did was that they went and like interacted with each other learned few things for like mm-hmm. an hour or so and after that they used to grab lunch and so it yeah. was pretty chill it was it wasn't like a formal society or club it was like more like few people will be coming together they will be interacting with each other yeah. learning things from each other so i like that thing in a way mm-hmm. so that's good coming to the next thing post study work rights because many people talk about mm-hmm. these things post study and one reason why i am not in uk right now is because of this because when i applied mm-hmm. to university of, like i was late when i applied for this universities in uk stuff so i got to apply to only one university and i applied in essex university for the september 2019 intake i got mm-hmm. the offer letter and i was like willing to go to uk because uk was like always my first preference yeah if keep the budget apart <laughs> so, yeah that's one thing but after that like uh, we had only 4 months of post study work right so it was like they want you to study in their country but as soon as you are done with your course get the hell out so i think that yeah that might have changed now cuz yeah, um, like after yeah, it changed it, and i felt bit yeah. by the uk government like how could you <laughs> so no yep. that's a real shame actually cuz uh, from what i looked at it right now uh, what you can do after you finish graduation over here no matter if it's bachelor's masters or post doctoral you have uh, you can apply to like the post graduation visa which allows you to work in the uk for 2 years and so after those 2 years um, you basically need to find work and everything during those 2 years and uh, get sponsored or whatever for your uh, working visa or whatever that is like and once you're on that kind of work visa uh, then in terms of if you're looking at long term pr then you need to be here for like 5 years once you're on working visa uh, but they have like a lot of rules within that so you can't leave the country for a certain amount of time you have to be here for like uh, such an amount of time continuously uh so basically the, yeah you have to follow all of those rules and afterwards you have to give um those kind of um exams for uh, it's really uh yeah it's really weird but you have to i don't know if you do now but at least my parents have to give exam for like life in uk and everything so you need to know like uk's history you need to know what it's like living in uk and they have that like really rigorous testing basically before you apply yeah. so you yeah you uh, how is it like in australia Australia is pretty same as like UK you get 2 years of post study work right after you do your bachelor's masters or phd it doesn't really mm-hmm. matter but the phd students they can like directly apply for this course, yeah, yeah as soon as they complete their study so it's pretty chill for them but yeah. if you get like a sponsor or you can get sponsored by the state as well like victorian state can sponsor you so you get extra mm-hmm. points for that and coming to the pr like next is pr so we can talk about pr so first of all let's start with uk and then i'm going to talk about australian pr so yeah like i said in terms of pr over here it's um you need to have your work visa like not your like graduation visa but i think um so after that when you have to work over here when someone sponsored you and everything you have a work visa on that you need to be here for at least 5 years and you need to fulfill all of their criteria they have some really specific criteria in terms of how long you can be here how long you can be out of the country at one time and all of that kind of stuff and at the end of that once you apply you need to i don't know if you still do need to give this anymore but at least my parents they have to give a uh, life in the uk uh, exam so that tests your knowledge on um, your history of like uk and um, what it's like to live in uk and everything 
and of course your English skills and that kind of stuff. I think if you're above a certain age limit, you may have to give like an English exam or something, uh, which I mean, you'll probably have to give that when you're coming to university over here anyways. But uh, it's, yeah, they have like really uh, small uh, rules like that you have to follow carefully. Same stuff. Yeah. But in our case, like in Australia, it is that you have to like, it's a point system based, first of all. Mm -hmm. So after you complete your bachelor's or master's, same, you get the points and stuff like that. So you can apply for PR and what do I say? Like in case of me, I'm going to complete my bachelor's. I'm going to work for two years. And then if I get sponsorship, I'm going to work even more and then like apply for PR. So it is more like if I get, if I work for three to five years over there in Australia, I'm going to get more points than if I'm going to work for zero to two years. So yeah, yeah. yeah this is pretty, and you have to like score more than eight, I guess, in IELTS. Uh, okay you, yeah i think it's probably the same over here like that yeah, I think it's, I it's because like, have, yeah. australia is still called commonwealth it's just yeah like, yeah that's where uk or some uh, like <laughs> in con connection with uk yeah so mm -hmm. pr is pretty similar australia mm -hmm. and uk but uh, australian pr is a bit easier than uk because i have like as far as i have heard it takes around if you are going as a bachelor student undergraduate student it takes you around uh, let's say nine to ten years to get a UK PR, if I'm not wrong. I think it depends on your job and like if you've, um, I think it can be done quicker because basically after your graduation, you'll have your two years. If you, within those two years, if you find work really quickly and then you work, apply for your work visa, then basically it's five years on work visa and then about one year or so afterwards if you complete the process in one word. Again, if you have breaks within those, I think the hard part is, um, following those rules really carefully because you can't be out of the country for a certain amount of time. So you can't go back to India and stay there for months at a time. You have to be careful about how long you go there for, how long you're here for and everything. That's where it can get a bit tricky. But if you follow it, then it's about five, six years after you get your work, like actual work visa. Okay. So, yep. That's... Like, so I think it's very similar to Australia. Around, like eight to nine years because at least mm -hmm. you are going to do a three-year bachelor's degree. Yeah, and yeah. Five, so this six, is afterwards, eight. yeah. And in, in terms of Australia, you get a PR in around five to seven years. So Yeah, so it's probably quicker over there. So that is why I came to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> you anyway, choose, I think that's that, like, yeah. Everyone goes to Canada or Australia because they want the PR and everyone that's is crazy yeah. about PR. Like, I think is, what's another good thing is um, there's a lot of international student community in Australia. Australia has basically made it into a business for international students. So you see a lot of it, like you'll no doubt like meet someone from where you're like, you've been brought up from. So you'll have like a lot of friendly faces and you'll have someone to like support you all the way through. UK, it's slightly less like common to have like a lot of international students. There are a lot of international students, but not as much as in Australia, what I found. Yeah, the benefit of being Indian is that you will get a very strong Indian community everywhere <laughs> in this world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I came to Melbourne, I was thinking that, okay, I have to make my own food. I won't find much Indian restaurants over mm -hmm. here in Melbourne. But I was shocked when I saw the Spencer Street and King Street. Yeah. Like literally two of the streets in Melbourne are called mm -hmm. Indian streets. Why? Because like they have so many Indian restaurants and Indian shops. You can yeah. have everything like parle ji or <laughs> achar and <laughs> exactly, stuff like that. Exactly. So, I think even in London, um, uh, you probably have heard of uh, Wembley area, like where Wembley Stadium is. The whole of Wembley area is kind of like Little India. And even when I'm going by train, um, I see Wembley, I identified by like just you, you just see like a lot of Indian people and everything. You can you have like Pani Puri and everything on streets over there. Oh, okay. So it's it's very Indian like that. So yeah, no matter where you go, you find an Indian community. That's for sure. That's right. And you were saying that Birmingham also is known as Little India something. Yeah, like there's uh very like there's um big parts of Birmingham and big parts of Coventry uh, as well as Leicester where there's like a lot of Indian community, and so you get everything you get in India, uh, like food wise and everything, the community, it's very, like there's a lot of like kind of um, Indian communities around. So you can participate in festivals and everything like that. Um, even in terms of uh, getting your everyday Indian kind of household objects, you can get that very easily. 
Yeah, like I, to my surprise, Indian festivals are celebrated with so much enthusiasm in Australia. Yeah. Clean yeah. Melbourne. When I'm talking about Australia, I'm talking about Melbourne. So because uh, when it was holy, I came back to India. So, but most of my friends were like sharing images, and there were Australians, there were people from Middle East, from UK. Everyone was like involved in that holy festival, and I, I was like quite amazed. So uh, yeah, it is like I think it's good. quite nice to have that. It's very yeah. nice to have that. Melbourne itself. It's very um, multicultural, so you have a lot of people enjoying all of this together, which is quite nice. That's right. So these things are like. they add to your experience definitely so, like so according to your experience which education system would you recommend and how was your experience of australia so i mean so education system wise personally i would still like um, prefer the uk system because it just just because it gives me um more time to learn things and it allows me to like learn them properly whereas it's not i personally felt like the australian system was a bit rushed and of course um like the thing is with um both countries they're very good in terms of the uh, quality of degree you get so no matter where you get your degree from you're going to have a very good future uh but yeah so it depends on in terms of how long you want to spend um learning things and everything personally i like to spread my work out a bit reflect on everything back to like the modules as i go along so that's why i prefer uk system experience wise again both countries give you a very amazing experience university itself is an amazing experience that's right but um so what you need to look at is the costs because in uk a lot of these experiences will cost you a, a significant amount of money and i mean even if it's like 5 pounds or 10 pounds it does add up and with the um, currency being like you know it's only 5 pounds it's only 10 pounds rather than 500 rupees a thousand rupees it's a lot easier what i find with my friends who come from india they spend a lot easier because they think it's only 5 pounds it's only 10 pounds but um it adds up a lot in the end whereas australia gives you a lot of um free experiences in that sense you get to do a lot of activities for free so if you're on budget then i would say definitely go to australia simply because you'll get the same experiences but the like uk wise i think culture wise like uk has a definite british culture and that's your typical kind of uh, what you probably see in movies and everything like your uh, formal or like pub and like um dinner nights and everything like that so you'll definitely get that over here whereas at least melbourne it was very multicultural so it wasn't one single culture so if you want to experience like a very rich kind of more than one culture definitely melbourne is the place to go it's been named the livable city like most livable city in the world and everything you have a lot of different uh, festivals going on so definitely that's a very unique experience so it depends on you um personally i'm very glad that i got to experience both and i'm going actually i think that's very brilliant that you can come to uk and experience this so actually that's a very good idea to maybe go study in australia and come for a year abroad in uk or like go somewhere for a year abroad to really get that experience and get that on your cv because it's something very unique so everyone's going to be doing your typical kind of um uh work in industry and everything like that a lot of people get that a lot of people get experience uh, like hands on experience but very few people actually go do something very unique like a year abroad so but as soon as you mentioned that uh, especially for employers in australia and uk the it stands out and so it allows you to talk a lot more than other candidates so i highly recommend the experience in general yeah that was the plan since the beginning mm-hmm. so when i <laughs> uh, my first semester i applied for a semester abroad yeah uh, you can that. check the like enthusiasm and yeah, happiness that i think I it's have. a really good idea yeah yep, that's right i was like having this in mind that i have to go for a semester abroad or maybe a year abroad mm. to uk or canada because like these mm. i hold uh, like offer letters from all three countries uk yeah. canada and Australia mm-hmm. so that means that I was interested in all three countries right yeah exactly at least you get to experience two of them yeah two of them so later on maybe the third one will also come in my bucket list more than everything that we were for some other day so mm-hmm. this was and one more thing last but not the least question what is the border updates for students international students enrolled mm-hmm. in uk universities So um I mean UK has been very funny about their like uh, you've probably heard of the latest news in terms of health secretary and like loads of things going on over here but 
as of right now, I think um, international students can still come down. Like I know a lot of international students who came down who've lived here. The only thing is, of course, you need to quarantine when you come down. You need to have um, probably like a vaccine or like some kind of uh, COVID test before you come over here. So you are allowed to come here. And actually, at the start of the pandemic, it was really advantageous for students from India because we know someone. So some universities were really desperate to really depend on the um, the international student population for the money. They were so desperate that they actually offered a lot of scholarships for people to come over here. And so that meant, you know, someone who was able to come over here with fully funded living costs, fully funded food costs and everything like that, and uh, have the accommod like university accommodation and everything. So that was quite good, very lenient. But of course, that depends based on your university. But in general, you're still allowed to travel. It's just your quarantine time. So you need to quarantine in a hotel here. You need to quarantine in a hotel in India and everything. So the first line that you said while answering this question was that UK has been really friendly. Yeah, right? very much. So, yeah. It, it is the contrast when we talk in for yeah. Australia. Australia yeah, has been about, very yeah. unfriendly. <laughs> like they mm -hmm. do not want international students back. That's the thing. And I've been also like sitting here in India for the mm -hmm. last 10 months and it's like really annoying, really annoying. I think it's a, it's a big shame to be fair, but I think, yeah, that also reflects on the cases. Australia's had a lot fewer cases and UK's Australia, had a big surge. But that was like the advantage they were having. They could have turned this advantage into another major advantage, vaccination. Mm -hmm. Like UK yeah. has opened everything. So if I'm not wrong, UK has even all... No, well, not like, quite. So like, I mean, pubs. Uh, we've still got some rules and everything in place. So I think the next date we're looking at is 19 July, but that currently isn't looking likely. There's um, been an increase in the number of cases. So what UK has done basically they've had like a set target. So when they meet this target, they can open this much up. So right now they've opened up like the majority of things in terms of everyday life. So you can go out shopping, you can go to the gym and swimming pool and everything like that. You can mix in restaurants and everything. But the next stage will be kind of indoors mixing and everything or like with people themselves, with families, uh, lifting restrictions in terms of the capacity, how much you're allowed to have. And so they're doing it wisely in terms of they're doing it step by step. But the only thing is because the, the, the problem that's been is there's been a lot of people coming in from abroad who haven't quite followed the quarantine rules or something. And so that's what, I mean, in between, they had a big surge in terms of um, the Indian cases and everything right now, like Delta uh, variant. Delta. And so that was, yeah, so they need to be very careful, which I think Australia has tried to avoid that. We're just shutting everyone out. happened for Australia as well. Like, uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, it still happened, but yeah. People escape from the quarantine centers in Australia, and yeah, it's sad. I heard that as well. It's it's sad to think it's people insane. are that. Upset, <laughs> like that's yeah. insane. And second thing is that uh, UK has vaccinated, I guess, fifty eight percent of its entire population till now. So yeah, they've done a very good job in terms yeah. of vaccination. Uh, vaccination. I think the population's been like fairly um, accepting in terms of the vaccines. Because another thing, Australia has been very reluctant in using the AstraZeneca vaccine which has set them back quite a lot. Uh, whereas UK, they've explained the vaccines and everything really well. They've educated people really well so that people have actually gone. Like they haven't said, no, I'm not going to take vaccines. Whoever's eligible has gone straight away. I just saw today on Instagram that mm -hmm. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has said, has said that AstraZeneca would be available to everyone now. So yeah, yeah no, it's available to everyone. The only thing is the Australian population, a lot of people are saying we're not going to take it because of this, like the, the blood clot uh, cases that came through. That's why they're having difficulties. Like which... in 2 million, 3 million, only 4 to 5 people exactly. have experienced yeah. this blood clot. It yeah, they need to, yeah, they need to really kind of COVID, of it. <laughs> then you will yeah. like have any consequences of yeah. this vaccine. And over it's here, Australia, the so-called the so -called developed country, has only vaccinated fully vaccinated 4.8 percent of its entire population which country australia australia oh wow Can that's surprising this? yeah that's like, very surprising and when it when we talk about india india is still a developing country but india has done still i would say better india's done amazing vaccine. in terms of vaccination until now to be fair like in this week, the average is 50 lakh around 50 lakh per week vaccination so no, that's yeah, they've done really good. Job in that. They did in four days. <laughs> no, that's really good. But yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. It should hopefully kind of go back to normal in half a yeah, year or so. Missing it a lot. Every day I wake up and I check the news and I feel that 
there should be some good news that okay these borders are going to open or something of that sort i can so, imagine uh, yeah. yeah fingers crossed that's all we can do for now let's now just open I'm the for two to three things first of all my approval for this university of birmingham yeah yeah and when and will that be again sorry will that be um, january in september january january oh, yeah that's so really so that's good my first preference was university of birmingham second one was queens so if i get in queens even then i would be really yeah because both of like canada australia uh, uk both of them are like yeah and there again the experience is what it's about like you have an amazing experience no matter where you go it's very unique when you do that so that's yeah that's, that's right. so we have covered everything and it was a long long talk yeah yeah and that was good though. that was good i thoroughly enjoyed it like it's yeah and no, i mean i uh, hope that was helpful for everyone as well if anyone has any questions uh like when this video goes out i'll drop my email in the comments so you can just email me or something not uh, if you have any but i just display your instagram and yeah a uh, parse instagram is displayed on the screen and his email id as well and you guys know my instagram id as well so and my email would be there in my youtube settings so if you have any questions regarding any uk universities please feel free to go to like instagram or uh, gmail and mm -hmm. trouble path so it would be i got plenty of time now yep that's right so have a great day path you too, you too. It was a great session.